I, I thought I might make a make a little plug. Uh, this this morning, uh, this morning I was talking to people at Jane Street about language design, and they're doing a, a whole, they're doing a embarking on a big effort to design a new, much more expressive programming language for their work. And this is like uh, this is an example of like using the right tools in anger, and they have done it. Uh, with great success. And I don't know if you've ever seen, Yaron Minsky is a principal there and he uh, he's one of the sponsors of Chain Street. Through him as one of the sponsors of the summer school and has been, I think pretty much since our inception or pretty close. And he's, uh, uh, he has interesting stories to tell about his experiences at Chain Street, uh, which involved it initially when they got started, they do uh, uh, a high speed uh, trading, high frequency trading. So whatever you may think of that, it doesn't matter. So they, they're, they're, they're writing a whole bunch of, they, they, they depend on their software very heavily for their entire business. And initially their code was written in Java and they had a frightening experience in the early days of their, in the early days of the company, whereby they put, uh, put, on, put on the market a boatload of securities uh, at the low, low price of $0. And, they were their asses were saved because the exchange will not let you sell something for zero dollars. Were it not for that, they would have been wiped out. If they'd have put them up for a penny, they'd be done. At that point, they said, "We need to be able to read the code," and and they started over. And they they've been ever since then doing everything in OCaml or they're they've actually been responsible for developing a lot of things in OCaml and have funded into existence. I can't remember the name of the organization, but there's a .org which is responsible for maintaining and developing Camel. And, you know, great thing. And so they're starting a new project in language design. And some of you may well be, uh, may well be interested in, in, in working there possibly. And I think they would be very interested in people who studied at the summer school amongst other places. So I'll just make a little plug for Jane Street. And I know that they are, I know that they're looking. I was talking to them this morning. So they have they have a lot of a uh, lot of good ideas, I think, in my opinion. So like very advanced, sophisticated programming language ideas. Okay, so I mentioned to you, uh, yeah, OCaml.org, well, it's called the obvious thing. Okay, sorry. OCaml Labs, right? Okay, good. That's what it is, right? Uh, so, okay. So what I want to do is I want to pick up from last time and I just want to recap a little bit. I realize that I'm going at a blistering pace, but uh, I'm trying that out this year and I'm hoping that this will be a useful compromise. Uh, uh, you know, that, that we'll see how it goes, but it seemed like it's a good, uh, good idea to give them some idea how all this stuff works and keep going. Okay, so what I write here, um, one moment, please. Okay, so the top things was the um, first of all they had the um, they had the um, yeah I'm sorry uh, give me um, give me a moment here I'm looking for my uh, what am I doing here. <clears throat> Okay, so let me uh, pick back up, I caught my bearings. So what we were doing is uh, we looked at recursive types where we had the idea of unfolding of something until we had a way of expressing a, a, a type that was uh, self-referential, that is it would refer to itself in some positions. And I illustrated in particular, you can do this in general, uh, but I illustrated the particularly interesting one of self-referential types of self-referential values. And I asked you to uh, carry out some reductions there and show how we could do the earlier work in the setting of the explicit setting of explicit types of this kind. So I left that as a as an exercise. We can talk about those separately or online uh, as you wish. It's fun to go through and 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 work work through those things and get used to them. Um, and in any case, I was showing how you could do the special case of uh, the fixed point operation so that you could do the 
the basic uh, recursion operations and the versions of BCF we started out with. So we, we looked at that. And then we went on and looked at uh, scoped and free assignables, where we had a notion of a declaration, uh, a declaration within uh, with, uh, for, of a, of a, of a uh, this should say there's something wrong here. One moment. I've been using, oops, I've been using the letter A for assignable. So let me continue to do that. And so the idea is it declares an assignable A, which is initialized to the value of E for use within the command M. And then there's a question about whether they're gonna be scoped or free, which is uh, determined by a uh, criterion about the validity of the return value, the type of the return value and the type of the assignable. So we went through that last time. I did that just to kind of bring out a, a famous thing that comes up with C regarding the, the scopes or the taking the addresses of, of uh, locally allocated uh, variables as they're called in C or assignables, I would call them. And then the associated operations for getting and setting. So we explained, so we went through that last time. That was the explanation I was giving you. And then uh, the observation, uh, the, you know, some observations that we went through uh, as regards to, um, uh, as regards to recursive types is once we have recursive types in the picture, we can show as Dana did a long time ago that when one when, when speaks of an untyped language, at least a well-defined untyped language, then it is in fact better to be thought of as unitype, meaning it's a well-typed language in the sense that it has only one type. And sometimes that's called untyped, like the untyped lambda calculus. But Dana argued, I take, it, take this directly from him, uh, is that it should be called unitype actually for that reason. And in his day, that was a very insightful, we're used to this now, but uh, it's because of him. So that was a very insightful point. So we mentioned that a little bit last time and I went through some of that. And, um, and then we, uh, in, in terms of the way I uh, dealt with the imperative programming features and declarations and so on, um, I was saying that it's very, very much like Algol originally in 1960, because Algol had the modal separation between expressions and commands that was present, but it didn't have a modality. And in fact, I, my own view is that's why they have a strong emphasis on call by name because they didn't quite understand the idea of having a modality of an encapsulated command as a value. And if you do have the modality, then I don't see the need for the call by name. So that's a curious thing. And, um, and so, uh, and the other thing was that in, um, in, in Algol originally, the fetching of the contents of an assignable was a form of expression. And I was questioning that. Uh, and the reason is, is that in Algol, every command is a unit command. There was no possible way for a command to return a value. And therefore you're kind of stuck. There's nothing you can do. Like what else are you going to do now? The assignables have to be thought of as forms of expression. And, 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 and indeed that's, that's the way it worked. Um, so, but, where, but in the more modern account that I'm proposing here, we have a type associated with command which was their return value. And then if you do that, then we can put the get as a form of command and you get a clean separation that the expression level is very well behaved mathematically, equationally can be reasoned about. And then you have the effects in the, or in the command level or the, the, the lax, the, under the, under the uh, governance of the lax modality. So, so that's what we were doing last time. So I kind of just wanted to expose you to that. And then at the end, I was remarking you know, this is the structure of Haskell because Haskell was a dialect of Algol. So the whole idea of the way that is structured, it comes from 1960 and including higher order functions in Algol, except that in Algol, you could pass functions as arguments, but you could not return functions as results. And the reason being is it wanted to restrict to stack allocation. It didn't want to deal with any kind of garbage management, garbage collection or storage management. And because of that, uh, you, but you can pass functions as arguments. And that was pretty damn sophisticated for its day. And it also had recursive functions and it was Edgar Dijkstra who figured out how to compile those. And so the modern runtime stack and how that all works is all due to Edgar Dijkstra as a matter of fact. So uh, it's just interesting that it had that structure. So, uh, and, and, and so the reason I introduced the idea of scoped and free assignables was exactly to bring out the limitations on the stack architecture that Algo would have. Now, it's you know, it, it turns out in programming languages like C, there is there is this idea of things are stack allocated, but whatever that means, because you can just return and have a pointer to something that doesn't make any sense anymore. So it's a little bit half-assed, but if you can do it right, and so that's what I was illustrating, um, so you can do that. 
Okay, so that was like a little recap of what we were talking about last time. And I thought it would be nice, I was trying to tie together you know, many ideas that I think are salient in the history of programming languages and how they fit together. Okay, so for example, it may not have been obvious to you because you're too young that, that Haskell is just dialect of algorithm. There's nothing new there as far as that structure goes. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's important to grasp. However, Algol in his day didn't have any possibility of, you know, uh, data structures like lists. I mean, it had instant floats and stuff you can assign to, to, to assign well, they, they called them variables. So it was a trade-off, but they were, you know, running on tiny little machines that sat in a machine room, you know, it was a very different world. So, okay. So anyway, I just thought I'd point that out because I think it's, I, I like for Algol to be appreciated better than, than it is, as did John Reynolds. So in a certain way, I'm, I'm paying homage to John Reynolds because he's the one who made me realize that Algol was like really super elegant language. And he, he was very attached to it to the end of his days. Uh, he was very, very much his uh, favorite, favorite language. He was interested in imperative programming quite a lot. In fact, he, at the near the end of his life, he, he discovered along with O'Hearn the idea of uh, separation of logic, a better, better way to do whole logic for such languages. Okay, so what I want to talk about today, because it came up and I noticed a lot of interest. So I thought this is a fun topic. So let me take some time to discuss it, which is what I call dynamic classification. And I think this 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 idea seems to be less well known and uh, than in other and uh, than I than I think other ideas I've talked about are. And so I I, I think it's worth worthwhile for us to 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 think about it. Um, it, it has it has an it has an interesting, it, I find it interesting because it lies at the nexus of many seemingly disparate ideas and it consolidates. And, and, it, and in the end, I'm, I'm going to say, this is a good example of like using these kinds of tools to do language design because it gives you the framework to prove things and also to know you've got the right answer. So there's this, there's this idea that there's a right way to do things and the framework I'm showing you is the framework in which one ought to do it, or at least that is the best known framework, which is the uh, manifestation of Trinitarianism, which is the connection between logic and types and algebra. So this all fits in this setting. So that's the that's the guiding think, light in some. Pro, please. Professor, do you think most people would have gotten tr Trinitarianism? I'm sorry, it's it's a random comment, but Trinitarianism, do you think most people would have gotten the reference? So I think the most Trinitarianism. people. Trinitarianism. What about have gotten the reference to Trinitarianism? Isn't that a reference to the uh, Biblical notion of three in one. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm taking something for granted, which I probably shouldn't. So I once wrote an essay, tongue in cheek, uh, called "Computational Trinitarianism," and oh, okay. it was uh, it was a play on the Catholic theory of God in three persons, and right. uh, and so and I was saying uh, the the uh, computational version of that is the uh, correspondence between types and logic, uh, type theory of programming and logic proofs and logic and, and structures and algebra, uh, category theory, basically. Okay. And so I was, exp I, I was, I was explaining that. Papers, uh, and that turns out to be, you know, just... someone someone just linked to it. I, I found it very Thank you. Thank you. a pleasure. I enjoyed writing that essay. It may be the only thing I'll ever be remembered for, but <laughs> but anyway, there <laughs> we are. Okay, so, uh, uh, so Thank you for I, I had fun with it. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay, so what I want to do is, you know, we've already talked about classification because we have, we've spoken in terms of sums. And here I just wrote down a bunch of sum types, except for convenience or for, you know, illustration, I gave names to the components because it's sort of natural. So in some way you think of Booleans, you know, in the most, oops, in the most uh, uh, austere sense, as you might say, I think of the Booleans as just being the sum of one and one, uh, but I can give a labels to these things. So I can say true and false carry no data, and so we have two copies of one and that's exactly what's going on with the Boolean. And, and when I did something like the quadrant, when I was referring to in uh, my example that I gave you on Monday about dynamic dispatch, there's a operation of the quadrant and it's an enumeration type as, a, as are the Booleans. Um, the biggest mistake in the world, I think I've mentioned this before, is to confuse the Booleans with propositions. That's like the worst thing ever. And in programming languages, are often, especially young students like freshmen are encouraged to commit with this confusion and at least to no end of mess. So if you'd like to know when I teach intro programming, I ban, there's no Booleans, they don't exist. 
there's no, in particular, there's no equal sign because that's a source of endless uh, mess. Uh, because, so you just ban it, it doesn't exist. So that's, that's my advice to any of you who teach. You just say, you've never heard of Booleans. It's the best way to do things because students think that if has something to do with like implication, it's like, no, 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 no. That's not what's going on. Wrong idea. Okay, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll leave that aside for now. So uh, the point is this is an enumeration type. And we talked also about in the same example about polar and rectangular points. And I also made allusion to like optional values, which resolves the bugaboo of the null pointer. You simply say, well, I, I don't have a number in my hand. I have an optional number, which means I might explicitly tell you I don't have it. Or I might say, oh, here it is, a 17. And if you do this, you make the type distinction and well, then your language is more expressive and you have a much more pleasant uh, world to live in. That lesson has uh, proved to be very difficult to convey uh, to language designers because, uh, well, that has been. Okay, so the thing I wanna get across here as we're working with sums is that the classes of data that I gave them names here to be suggestive, but the, the injections that are there for the sum types, they're fixed statically by the type. As soon as I say it's one plus one, I'm telling you there are two classes of data of that type. No, in left of, well, no tuple, it has to be because it's one, or in right, which is no tuple, it has to be because it's one. So it has two whole elements and so we call that two. So one plus one is two and two is a synonym for bool. So that's like an example of how we think about this. So, uh, so I wanna say straight away because there is a strong tendency in C to the pants programming language design especially in the untyped world, to allege that dynamic anything is automatically a thousand percent better than static anything, okay? It's dead wrong. And that's a point that I want to explain here because when I fix it, there are only two Booleans, I care about that. I don't want there to be like some fourth, third or fourth Boolean floating around just because you feel like it. No, I meant two. So when you have untyped languages, you get a mess. You can't express this. You have all these atoms, you know, there's a, I don't know if you ever studied the list, but there's a hilarious confusion about nil and sharp T and sharp F and, you know, basically they don't know what they're talking about. They never sorted it out. It's a complete colossal mess. And, and it's just because not understanding sums. So I wanna say, just to get across a point, because I feel, uh, I feel that this is important, is I do want static sums. I am not alleging in any way that somehow this is a bad idea and you wanna have you know, only dynamic sums. That's a common move in C to the pants language design, it's invariably wrong. So the reason is proof by induction or case analysis, the case may be, is fundamentally important to reasoning about your program. You wanna be able to say, there are only two Booleans, so if I cover both of those, I'm good. Any of you who programmed in Haskell or Camel or any of the dialects of ML know the virtues of coverage checking. I remember John Reynolds himself, of all people, uh, when he was writing his Forsyth compiler, he decided to write it in standard ML. And he came to my office one day with absolute delight because he realized the, how important the sums were and the coverage checking was. And he said to me that, uh, you know, he understood it and sort of mathematically, but he never realized how important it was for writing code. And he, many of you, maybe all of you know this, if I imagine writing a compiler, you add in some new form of statement, automatically the coverage checker tells you all and only the places you have to update in your compiler. That's a godsend, okay? Whereas in languages like you know Java or other untyped languages, they make a big virtue about, oh, you just bung in whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. Nobody gets in your way. No, completely the wrong idea. 100%, 180 degrees out of phase with reality. But that's not to say you don't want dynamic classification. What it is to say is you don't want it forced on you. You see, and that was my point about recursive types. It's all well and good to have recursive type. I'm all in favor, okay? I just don't want to have it forced to me that there's one true recursive type in the world. Like what? I mean, it, when you put it this way, you realize it's insane. And you know, you could, if you wanted, you could program an ML by at the very first line, defining a data type, which is the value space of your favorite untyped programming language, and then confine yourself to that type. That will last, you will, you will last doing that about a good 10 minutes, I would say, before you can't stand it anymore because you realize this is idiotic indeed. So that's like the point is that the strictures are where, they, where the power comes from. And then I can relax them. If I wanna confine my attention to one type, well, 
all right, I don't know, uh, as you wish. Okay. All right. So the point is, I want to be able to make distinctions. So the, the so we get coverage checking with the value things because of the because of the uh, the fixed number of classes. And as I've, I've been alluding, it's it's both a plus and a minus that it's not dynamically extensible. So now the point I want to make is that we can, of course, consider the possibility of a dynamically extensible sum. So I can, uh, the various terminology has been used for this. One is, uh, I call it in my book, the type classified for reasons that will become apparent in a moment, because as you could even guess in the finite sum case is that the values of this type are marked with their class. So you could say that they're classified, but I want the term classified to be used in a stronger sense to mean that they are, so for example, with Boolean, I have two copies of one. So it's not a union, I'm, I'm, I'm marking of the left copy and the right copy. The fact that they're both the type one, well, whatever. Okay, that, that's, what, that's not important. Okay, so, so what classified is doing is similar thing, but you can think of it as a sum type where at any given moment in time, you know a bunch of the sum ands, but then there's always dot, dot, dot. Okay, so that's the idea. There's always some, uh, to be determined, you could say. That is, there are, there are some ends that have not yet been determined. And indeed, they're not going to be determined at compile time, even if you go through a great deal of trouble to do, for example, whole program compilation, uh, you're, still, you're still not gonna win because I want dynamic generation. That's what's extremely important about this. Okay, so that's the, that's the important idea. So I'm gonna think of classified, and I underline the here because this is just a little bit of an aside. Um, it's often alleged that you somehow want many different versions of the type classified, but you do not. If you have a programming language that supports data abstraction, particular programming language with modules, then I can make as many versions of classified as I like using the abstract type mechanism. So what is important is the one and only type of dynamic classification. So I, I kind of want to stress that. If I get the time to talk about modules, which won't be today, I think, then I can, I, can, uh, I can back that up and tell you what I mean. But, uh, but anyway, I just sort of make that as an aside. Okay, so now the, the word classified is a deliberate pun because on the one hand, it's classified in the sense of what we did with sums, except that the sum ands that are available are generated dynamically, okay? So at any static moment, yeah, classified is some weird shorthand for classified. Yep, uh, someone said on the, on the chat. Um, except that the sum ands are generated dynamically. And, and at a given moment of time, you may know about some of those sum ands and you may not know about others, which gives rise to the following, the other interpretation of classified, which is like the one you hear about in you know spy movies, okay? Which is that the data is classified according to some criterion of what it means to be allowed to either like create such a thing or what it means to be able to read such a thing. Okay, so we have documents like that. And the, the lingo for this is uh, confidentiality and integrity. And the idea is that uh, you wanna, uh, in fact, the one and the same mechanism accomplishes both. And what I'm gonna tell you is that the dynamic classification is perfect encryption. That's the thing I wanna get across. And it's because of the miracle of alpha equivalence. It's a very beautiful thing coming up if you haven't seen this before. It's like makes you realize how important the lambda calculus is. And, and because these ideas go back to church in 1930 before physical computers existed by a good 20 years practically. So like, it's really uh, remarkable, okay? But anyway, the idea is that the word integrity means that I want to limit or understand the provenance of a piece of data. Where did it come from? So we will say, so the way I like to think about it is that the, the, class, the class that I associate with a datum, especially in, in the dynamic case, is a proxy for an invariant that must hold of it. And the way in which I enforce that invariant is I control who can create that value. So the provenance is important because those are the parties who are entrusted to ensure that the invariant holds. Now, the other side of that is the, the uh, confidentiality of the data. And that's what you're doing there is you're limiting its influence. If I give you a piece of data and it's, let's say, you know, in the canonical jargon is top secret. If I don't have a top secret clearance, then it cannot influence my behavior, if you see what I mean, because I am not able to decrypt it. 
Okay, so that is the that is the point. So I, I think of it as as the, as a matter of provenance, provenance and influence. Uh, the word provenance is definitely used in the literature, but I didn't look it up. I, I felt like I made up the word influence this morning, but uh, for this purpose, but maybe some other terminology or even that very terminology, I'm not sure is used. Provenance definitely is, but I'm not positive about influence, but I thought it was a good word and it kind of rhymes with provenance. So I kind of liked it. Okay, so there are two sides to the coin and then we're going to see that this is conceptually what we wish to achieve. And the the technical mechanism that I will develop completely uh, uh, exactly corresponds to this. So it's in, in a way, if you haven't seen this kind of thing before, it's a nice work example of using the tools that I'm kind of overviewing for you of language design to achieve something that you care about. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the nice idea. Okay, so here we here's what we do. So we have three sort of mechanisms which are all interlocked in a in a way. So one is the idea of dynamic generation of classes. And it's a, it's a lot like what we did with declarations of assignables. And as you will see on the next slide, there, there's quite a similarity to that. But what I want to do is I have the idea of introducing a new class, uh, which is of type sigma. Sigma is describing the type of the data that it is protecting or that is, that is going to be labeling. In other words, we're going to take a value of type sigma and we're going to label it with a class and then it will thereby be classified, okay? So we're going to have a new class and we're going to use that class within a computation or command. So this is the scope of the assignable. Okay, uh, excuse me, it's not the assignable, it's the scope of that class, scope of the class. As a matter of fact, well, you're going to see what happens. In the end, I'm going to be able to even derive assignables from this, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so uh, I put up here in brackets because I won't do it here because I don't find it very useful. But in principle, I could restrict the scopes of these classes to, to confine them to M by imposing mobility restriction, but I don't see a need to do that. So I won't, I won't impose that. I'll let them be free assignables. So that means I don't have any restrictions on type or free classes, but I don't. I don't, that means I don't have any typing restriction. I can return right here, I can return. I'll show you how that goes in a moment. I can return that from M, that's no problem returning A, the class A in a form which I'll explain, can be returned. I don't, I don't mind that, but the dynamics must account for it. And how does it account for it? By using scope extrusion in a way that I'll explain. So there's a certain similarity to what I've already taught you pertaining to assignables uh, for imperative programming. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay, so once I have a class in play, and notice that what I do here is I put I put the the class in scope on the signature as I did with assignables. So right now I'm ignoring assignables. I'm just gonna like put, you know zoom in on just just uh, dealing with uh, dynamic classification. Okay, so there we have that. So we have some idea of class generation, and we know within them that we're allowed to use A. Okay, now they then what can I do with it? So I I made some notation. It's not what I used in the book. I just felt like using this notation this morning, so I did. Um, so it says if I have a, a, a value e, an expression e of type sigma, which is the type, oops, excuse me, which is the type associated with that class, then um, then I can classify it. So the up arrow uh, is, you could call this uh, ceiling if you like, or encryption if you like, because that's what it's gonna turn out to be. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. So what I'm doing is, um, labeling, I'm labeling E with this tag A, and but the A has been dynamically generated. It's not a predetermined thing like true or false that everybody knows about because it's written right there in the type. It's a private thing that you have generated as part of your code. Now, if you are in possession of, of, that, of that particular class, then you can label a datum with it, okay? And thereby make it classified. So this is how we encrypt, okay? Now that's the first thing I don't want to say. And then the other thing I can do is declassification, which says if you give me uh, something which is classified, I can uh, try to get at the underlying data by using a wrote down arrow by saying, well, treat it as being of class A. Well, that it might or may or may not be true that it's of class A. And so you get back an optional sigma, a one plus sigma as I wrote it here. So this would also be written as a sigma option or maybe sigma or whatever the terminology is, okay? So it's a civilized null pointer kind of scenario. So the, the decryption might decline to give you any, any result or it might give you a result labeled sigma. 
Okay, so that's the the basic mechanism. And the question is, you know, how do we how do we uh, execute these things? So I want to give them dynamics. And so I'm sketching here, and I'm doing it in the context of this kind of process algebra based idea about states because I need dynamic generation. Okay, so I need to be able to create these, and it's an effect. Okay, that I create a new class. That's super important. Without that, the whole thing doesn't work. Okay, I really need that. Okay, so what happens is when I want to allocate a new class and I'm running that process that wants to allocate a new class, then what I do is, well, I allocate a new class, that's the new here in the state, and then I'm running the body on. Okay, so that's that's the entire idea. Okay, so we do this. Now, subsequent execution, if you recall from the dynamics I gave to the process calculus, can go inside the scope of the new. Okay, that's fine. Moreover, I will, I didn't explicitly indicate it here on the slide, but I intend for us to have scope extrusion in the sense that the news can propagate to, to the outside or to encompass any other parallel threads. So that if I send a class reference, as I will show you in a moment, to another process, then they will have they will have to be within a common, uh, the scope will have to be enlarged to put them in there because I'm not attempting to restrict the scope. Okay, so that's what I'm doing there. So it's very similar to what I do with assignables, but there's no, what's missing here is there's there's nothing resembling like a hook e or something that that doesn't exist it's the mere existence of of a that i care about and it's associated type what type of data does it classify so that's what i'm doing here okay so that's how you allocate one of those things and then the idea is that well uh an encrypted as it were or classified value is a value provided e is if you want to do it strictly i didn't mind about that or otherwise if you want to make it strict like that then you can uh, you have to evaluate it before it gets to be a value. And then the critical thing, as you could have guessed, is going on is that in the presence of this class, if I have something which is in fact sealed, encrypted, labeled, whatever the word you like is, uh, with the class A or classified by A, and I declassify it at A, then the underlying datum is pops out and is labeled as in the, in the success branch because the type was one plus sigma in this particular case. So that was the idea there. On the other hand, and this is an important property of these uh, symbols, is that I need to be able to check them for disequality. That's of the essence, which means I cannot have any notion of substitution going on for, for these symbols, because if I do, I could would be able to substitute the same thing for one thing, and the disequality would be disrupted. That can't be allowed. Okay, so, so that's important. So I have a disequality. So this is you know, separateness, apartness, disequality, words like that. So if I'm trying to decrypt something as being as if it were encrypted at A, but it's actually encrypted with B and A is different from B, then it just fails and it tells you it did. Now, if I wanted, I could make, yeah, yeah, you could write it like that. I want an affirmative notion. I want it to be affirmatively distinct. This is like a constructive hair splitting. Let me not worry about this right now, okay? So, uh, so there's a reason. If you look at Pitts, uh, Pitts's work on uh, on um, names, I, I've forgotten the terminology at the moment. The, that's where this uh, inspiration comes from. Okay. Now, if I look at if I look here, um, so let me just say, you know, look at Pitts's Pitts's monograph. Okay, uh, it's not literally this, but it, it, it's what inspired me. Okay. Now the I'm on a logic. Oh, that was loud. Uh, let me turn my headphones down. Oh, right, sorry, ahead, please. Yeah. yeah, it's nominal logic, I think is what he calls it. Or nominal, yeah, nominal logic. Yes. Yeah. yeah, nominal set. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I couldn't think of that word at that moment. Okay, so the thing I want you to notice here is that I have a binder in the source syntax. And when I, when I execute that new class, what I do is effectively shift the binder. Well, in the present scope extrusion, I make it global. But it's still a bound identifier. Now, here's something that is super important. I don't think I stressed it before, but I might have. And I just want, it's something you already know, but I want to make sure you understand this. Whenever you have a bound identifier, in this case, it's going to be a bound uh, class, uh, a name that I have here, A. The, the important thing is from the outside, if I look from outside here, the bound identifier is never what you think it is. That is of paramount importance because of the miracle of alpha conversion. Because whenever I write down some piece of syntax with binders, I'm implicitly taking it modulo alpha equivalence. So I wrote down new A here, 
And you might think, oh, well, that's encrypted with the key. Oh, hey, you could think of it like that. No, I'm sorry. You're automatically wrong because the, the alpha variation means that it can deftly uh, rename itself and get out of the way so that it's never what you think it is. That is crucial and it's absolutely crucial. So uh, these are taken, I'll write mod alpha. And if they're taken mod alpha, it means that the, so to speak, encryption key cannot be guessed. So what is happening here then, as we look at this, is this we can think of this as encryption and we can think of this as decryption. And if I have not handed you information about what this, what this A is, if you don't have it available to you, you're not going to be able to guess it. So the idea is that this model is perfect encryption. So from this point of view, the standard like encryption things like the RSA method or so on can be thought of as a way to implement alpha equivalents without having a binder. Because the idea would be at scale, if I try to think of my programming language as some, having some universal scale, this new A would be like out in Andromeda somewhere, okay? And this is like not really very practical. Where does that binder live? So what you do is you settle for, instead of having perfect encryption, you settle for with high probability. And so what's happening is like, the way I like to think about it is something like the RSA is implementing alpha equivalents in a scope-free way and it compromises by giving you only with high probability. Now I admit you don't care, but I'm, I, I think it's important to understand it this way. The reason being that way I can model encryption without having to go through any cruft whatsoever. It's just a matter of alpha equivalents. Beautiful, very nice idea. It's the exact same thing that makes abstract types work. When I have a new type in one form or another, what is it makes it new? It's an unguessable secret. It automatically gets out of the way. It's different from any type you have around. It's any type you will in the future have around when you link with code that you haven't even seen yet. It will automatically be different. It's the same principle, except that with abstract types, it's a static notion. And with dynamic classification, as the name implies, it's a dynamic notion. Bingo. So I, I often find myself in the position of really wanting to emphasize strongly the seemingly innocuous or even tedious and annoying idea of alpha equivalents is in fact one of the most powerful ideas in computer science. And uh, I can tell you amusing war stories about trying to explain these ideas to my non-PL colleagues and getting absolutely nowhere. But, uh, uh, but anyway, there you go. There's some allergy to lambda calculus. I don't know whether you realize this, you know, I guess there's sort of two, two types of people in the world. Those of us who get Lambda and those who never will. <laughs> so it's sort of been my experience. That's kind of how it works. So uh, it's kind of weird. It's the only linguistic model of computation. And interestingly enough, you know, if you think about it for a few minutes, the only spot at which Church's law about the universality of any number of computation models, in particular the Lambda calculus, the only spot where it has any force is comparing the Lambda calculus to every other machine model. Because every other machine model is trivially equivalent to every other machine model. And if you tell me, oh, they're all trivially equivalent, it's a yawner. It's like, why are you bothering telling me this? Obviously, okay. If I have you know, a Turing machine with red and blue ink, I mean, it's just an absurdity. Okay, so of course it doesn't compute anything more. But if you say to me that Turing machines and the Lambda calculus compute the same thing, that is a substantial remark. And that is the best evidence there exists for Church's law to my knowledge, Church's law being the statement that computable functions from NN are always gonna be programmable in the Lambda calculus or pick your favorite thing, okay? The Church's law says all those models of comp computation are equivalent as regards functions definable on the natural numbers. I have to wag my finger and hammer away at that. It doesn't mean anything whatsoever. It gets generalized into meaninglessness, but the, the it's important. Okay, but that's Church's law. And I guess I'll take a moment to push this point. It's the only scientific law in computer science that I know of. Church's law is exactly analogous to Newton's law of gravity or something, Newton's force law. It's been empirically verified up the wazoo. Okay, no one doubts it for one bit. So way we think, that's what Church's law is. It's a scientific law. It's a matter of empirical, it's empirical evidence. 
not a matter of proof. And, and yet, weirdly enough, for some reason, it's never presented as a scientific law. I find that. So I have a little crusade going for quite a long time, which is to push the idea that uh, it, quite possibly someone made a remark about Haskell Paul. I, I don't know, but it could very well be. Um, uh, so I, I want to push this point. I'd like you to, it, it's commented on in my book in a footnote, as a matter of fact. It, it's, it's really the only scientific law in computer science. If you know of another one, I would be very happy to you know, think about it. It'd be really cool if there were. But this is the one I know. And uh, so I insist on in calling it Church's Law. Never will I call it Church's Thesis or something like that. No. No, you don't talk about you know, Newton's guess, do you? <laughs> no. You're talking about Newton's Law. Why? Because it's been verified. OK, enough. OK, so the, so the thing that I was, point I was just making is, is that uh, the point about these being unguessable secrets. And that's a, that's a really powerful and useful so, uh, idea. Professor, uh, Professor, to interrupt if you, you don't mind. Are you saying that Church's law is the one, Church's law is the one place where computer science is actually a science in the sense of a natural science? Yes, uh, that's what I otherwise. think, yes. That's my that's point. That's what you mean, yeah. That's, what I thought. that's my right, point. Right, that's, right. that's why I want to call it Church's law. Yeah. Precisely. It's I think it's what, yeah. and if you know of another law, I really would love to know it. But uh, but certainly this is this is this is the one, and then therefore it's right. justifiable to call it computer science. And interesting enough, it arises from the one and only linguistic model of computation as opposed to a machine model. And right. yeah. you know, and weirdly enough, you know, if you look in, I'll I'll go, I'll go ahead and be, exaggerate, but not by much. Every single book on computability theory does not mention lambda calculus. <laughs> it's preposterous. Okay, but anyway, that's the way it is. It's the only one that matters. So, okay, yeah, I was thought somebody might mention this. Uh, probabilistic programming language. I, I suspect there's a law to be formulated there. And whoever brought that up, Alex Liu, apparently, um, not someone I know, but thank you, Alex. I, he or she, I don't know. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, that, uh, that's, that's a very good point on the chat. Okay, let me go on. All right, so anyway, it gave me a way to do it. Okay, so now, so the only thing I want to explain now is that, so if I look at back now at the ideas of confidentiality and integrity, so the idea is that if I'm able to decrypt, then I can, then, then the value can have influence on me. And if I'm able, able to encrypt, then I'm asserting its provenance. Because since I'm having the ability to encrypt, then it, I'm the one who's assuring you that, uh, that the invariant that governs this data by virtue of having been encrypted with this key, I'm assuring you of that fact. Okay, do you see how this goes? So the fun thing is that possession of a key and being able to encrypt, I claim should be understood in terms of asserting an invariant. So what this does, so what this does is it tells you that what you should concentrate on in connection with this uh, modeling of encryption is you should concentrate on, you could say who, in other words, suddenly principles come into the picture because we now have to worry about which parties in a, in a computation scenario have access to which capabilities. And in fact, that brings me to the notion of capability that I uh, alluded to last time in connection with uh, mutable storage also applies here. The notion of taking the address is a generic notion. It's not really tied to memory. The idea of a reference, not really tied to memory. And one way to explain it is invariably, it's a matter of having certain capabilities. So in the case of mutable or signables, then ampersand A means I have the capability get and set. It might, you might also mean having the capability to compare for equality. That will raise a, an issue that I don't wish to discuss right now, which is related to the serious problem of single and and, and, and multiple dispatch and object-oriented scenarios. Let me ignore that for right now. I don't wish to go off on a tangent there, but it's one of the reasons why that whole model doesn't work. Okay, but anyway, if we can think of ourselves as having the capability here to classify and declassify. Okay, so I just wrote it as classify. So the idea is that if I have ampersand an A and A is, a, is representing, uh, is you know governing data of type sigma, then to classify it means give me an element of type sigma and I will turn it into something that's classified. And then this is the Cartesian product here. And then I have another, another operation which says, give me a classified thing and I'll recover a one plus sigma from it, okay? Now, the important thing is it's a Cartesian product. 
And because it's a Cartesian product, the components are separable because I have projection. So I can actually separate now the capability to encrypt, which governs the provenance, and I can separate the capability to decrypt, and that governs its influence. Okay, very nice. And now if you think about it for a moment, that uh, this is exactly what you're doing when, like in the spy movie, you classify things as top secret. You don't want that information to be influential to anyone but the president or something like that, whatever the scenario may be. That's the point, okay? That's what you're doing. So now that leads me to a, just a brief suggestion here. I think the right way to think about information flow type systems, if you know about them, is exactly this idea that you have a typing, you have a notion of type refinement, refinement types. I haven't been able to talk about this now, but let's just say properties of the values of a type. And I wanna be able to say a property like something that's encrypted with E is a classified value at encryption level A. You see, the dynamically allocated key can be identified with the security level, okay? And decryption is gonna give you back a value at the level A because you must be at the level A in order to access it. And from there, you can, you can riff on this and you can develop this. And the idea is that the dynamically allocated class is going to be the security level of the datum. And then statically, then the reason you wanna do this information flow type system is that way you can control in the program, which parts of the program can see which bits of information. Ah, so this is, uh, this is uh, an idea. This, this uh, I will just mention, this is a, a paper that I'm working on with John Sterling at the moment. It arises in a larger setting, but I, if I talk about modules, I'll come back to that. Okay, good. So that's the kind of setup. So I have this idea of classification, dynamic classification, and I'm drawing the analogy to you that dynamic classification, which lets me generate new classes on the fly, but extend that sum n. So I have this plus this or this or this, and the or just keeps going as I execute. That that's a, can be understood as an encryption mechanism, which by the miracle of alpha equivalence is perfect encryption, can't be guessed. Okay, you can never, there's uh, lit, literally no way that you could ever like uh, decrypt it unless you have the appropriate capability, which I'm explaining here. And then information flow type system to use to control that. Now I mentioned to you last time that this has everything to do with exceptions. So here, are some of the things I'm alluding to have relatively obvious application because I'm using the words in a way that's to suggest them. But I just wanna have, one that I think is, I want to call attention to one that I think is possibly less obvious to many people. So I want to, that's what I want to bring out. And the slogan is, and I wrote a paper about this, it's called Exceptions Are Shared Secrets. And I wrote this, uh, I wrote a paper about this for uh, Don Sanella's Festschrift uh, a few years ago, uh, because he and Alan Mycroft and some other people had, uh, had everything to do with inventing what is the type X and in standard ML. So it's related to all of this, okay? So this is all supported in standard ML. It's just that the terminology that was used there uh, obscures the underlying reality. So the thing I want to, I want to get across with, get across is the following thing. What do I mean by an exceptions or shared secrets? And, and here I want to address a common methodological point that I see made very often that I consider to be erroneous which is that you should be allergic to exceptions. Exceptions are a bad idea. And my claim is exceptions are only a bad idea insofar as you're doing it wrong. Okay, sorry, not to be too offensive, but anyway, I want to, I want to be emphatic. Okay, so, 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 so this is the thing I want to say. What you want to be able to do, the thing that people are concerned about when they're dealing with exceptions and they criticize them, is they're worrying about them being intercepted that a party that is raising an exception wants to reach a certain handler and it wants to know that it's reaching the handler that it wants it to reach. It doesn't want to reach any old handler whatsoever. It doesn't want to be in a situation where because I link with a new body of code, suddenly my exception error is intercepted by a different body of code. No, you don't want that. If that's your notion of exception, I agree. That's a, that's a terrible idea and get rid of it. Now, that doesn't mean exceptions are a bad idea. It means if you do it right, it's a good idea. And the key is you encrypt the data that you raise with an exception and the handler can decrypt it and the raiser can encrypt it. In other words, the provenance is the person, the party that raises that exception and the 
confidentiality is confined to the handler. No one else can create that value, uh, uh, something that that handler would would handle because it, you have control over the provenance. That is the idea. Okay, it's absolutely critical. And the thing that's really important is that you do dynamic allocation of exceptions. And this fact has implications, has more implications than I'm going to. Uh, I'm a, I'm slightly afraid I'm going to spoil. Some of you might be might not like what I have to say, and I can only I can only say uh, I'm sorry. I'm explaining the way I look at things. It, don't take it personally. Because a, a discussion came up about that yesterday, and I have this discussion every year. So I have a world view, and I present it to you. I feel that's my responsibility. Uh, but the you may not like it. All right, disclaimer done. Okay. All right. So. The, so the idea is this, how do I explain all of this? Well, I'll use a notation that's reminiscent of what you have in, in ML, like in CAMEL or standard ML, but it's reminiscent you know, many languages that do exception properly. By the way, Haskell does not and cannot. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, it's botched actually. I don't, I don't know whether you realize this. Okay, but I, I will point this out. Uh, I wrote an essay about it once and people got very mad at me about it. So I actually, I think I took it down from my website. Okay, so, so here's the idea. So in, in language like standard ML, you have the ability to allocate an exception. It's called exception A of sigma and M, some, some notation that looks like this. So you can say exception error of string, maybe, I don't know, something like that, or whatever it is you're doing. And the thing that is out is some type that is a meaningful to you. And, the, and then you're generating a new exception. What in God's name does that mean? And by the way, what is the status? of that identifier in something like standard ML. Oh, it's not what you think. Most probably, forgive me for being a little presumptuous, but I have some experience to draw on. It's very likely what is going on there is not what you think. I know this from talking to many people. If it is, I, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm entirely happy about that and forgive me, but I, I wanna make sure that I, that I get this point across. The point is when you process new exception declaration, you're allocating a new class dynamically which has a side effect. It must be in the storage part of the, it must, it, it, if I go back here, you see, it allocates a new class. That's why I have this sort of process-based notation. It allocates a new class, it allocates a new exception constructor, whatever word you want to use. And it must be thus, it must be dynamically generated in order for it to be a secret. Because if there are only like 10 of them that you know in advance, well, then you can guess them, can't you? Okay, so the point is, it needs to be something that can be hidden from anyone else. So the new class, so the new class works exactly like that. This is a little oversimplification because in fact, what happens is it, you have a variable here, X, and X gets bound to ampersand A. I didn't, I didn't um, spell that out in this slide. I wanted to just present a few ideas incrementally. In, in, in reality, it's even more complicated than I'm showing you. It, 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 it involves references to exception constructors or the capabilities that I was describing a moment ago, which are bound to a variable. And why do I wanna say that? Because variables X and Y, variables properly so-called, not assignables, variables do not have identity. It is not meaningful to dispatch, if you wanna say that, on the fact that you have two different variables X and Y, because they, you could plug in the same thing for both of them because you have contraction. It means that disequality is not stable under substitution, but the whole idea of a variable is that it be a placeholder for a thing you're gonna substitute. So it's really important. So what happens is this is actually a variable X bound to ampersand A. And if I have some variable Y bound to ampersand B, uh, it could be ampersand A and ampersand B are the same thing. The fact that they're a different variable doesn't tell you anything. There are other implications I'm going to draw, so but we'll show you. So it has an effect. In Haskell, last I knew anyway, you were supposedly in pure code able to declare an exception. Uh, last time I checked, it's wrong. It does not work. So uh, you have to, so it's a, it's a serious problem. It's one of the problem, one of the reasons why insisting on, as I've done here, insisting on a modal separation between effectful code and pure code is like an idea I like on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I hate it, okay? And this is an example because 
when I'm allocating exception, that's an effectful operation. I'm sorry, that's all there is to it. And, and that's going to have some influence on your code. Okay, so I just want to say that and get that on the table. If you're trying to do this in a pure way, not doesn't work. The wrong idea is not, not the right idea. That's my argument. Okay, good. So then how do we raise something? Well, it seems all we to do me now... that, uh, Yes, please. Professor, yep, uh, uh, it seems to me that this black statement, allocating an exception is an effectful, uh, is an effectful thing in Haskell. I mean, even allocating if you get a one or, takeaway or from, from, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that itself is a terrific takeaway from all your lectures, just for many of us, I think, for me at least. It's, to it's, you, it's a great it's takeaway, it's a great takeaway. It's a great takeaway. Oh, okay, good. It's a great all right, well, I, take, take okay, home message. Good. Take home message. Yeah, never, never, yeah. Okay, um, okay good. I, I'm, I'm glad about the module boundaries. When you have a boundary of a module. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Very important question. Every time you evaluate a module, the exceptions that are declared, that are declared in there must be executed dynamically as part of the initialization of that module. It's extremely important. I, if I have time to talk with you in a separate lecture about modules, I have a lot to say there. And modules are ignored at people's peril. And the only language that I know of that ever took up the proper module design besides standard ML is OCaml and derivatives thereof of the ML family. Uh, I'm not really up to date what they're doing in um, what is the Apple language. Um, uh, somebody knows it that's derived from ML. Uh, I could think of it in a moment. Um, Oh, but uh, other languages don't don't do this right. In particular, Haskell is a joke. It has no modular at all. It's like, but that's that's another story. Okay, so uh, it's a pity. Okay, but that's the way it is. Okay, so uh, so anyway, back to the chase. So the point is, when you raise an exception, what you're doing is you're encrypting a packet and then you're raising it. Why are you encrypting it? because you have arranged with yourself, if you would like to say this, that you know the body of code that can handle it. If it's encrypted, it's a black box. As that exception makes its way up past other handlers, the poor other handlers, they try to decrypt it, as I will show you in a moment. They don't know it from Adam because you have control over what new exception you generated. And you have control over who can decrypt it and therefore who can intercept that exception. Bingo. This is the essence of what you should do with exceptions. And if you don't do this, you're not doing it right. And if you criticize exceptions on the grounds you're not doing it right, well, actually I'd have to agree with you, but there is a way to do it properly. That's my point, okay? So that's what I, what I want to say. And guess what? It was done in standard ML from day one, okay? From 1985 and probably before that, okay? So I'll just mention that, okay? Good. So what happens with the try otherwise, which is a handler? I, I could have written it. I'm, I'm gonna explain it in terms of something else I introduced, which is the bind otherwise. Okay, so I wanna explain it to you now. So it says run some code. And if it raises an exception, which is namely A, and the associated value is Y, then I'm gonna execute M prime instead. Okay, so that's like a typical mechanism. I could fiddle with this, but that's a, a typical sort of way you, you write down a piece of code where you have an exception. So what do you do? You do a bind otherwise. It says run that command down, okay? If it makes a normal return, you just return that value. You can forget that you ever mentioned the otherwise. Okay, so that's clause number one. On the other hand, if it makes an exceptional return, that exon, that is of type exon, which is a synonym for classified, as I mentioned, as I mentioned up here. So now what I do is I try to decrypt it because you see, I'm a party who knows about A and I decrypt it and I decrypt it with A. And if the, if the decryption fails, if it's an exception I don't know about, I just re-erase it. There's nothing I can do with it, guy. I can't look at it, I can't get at it because I don't know the key with which it is encrypted. If I do know the key with which it's encrypted, then I run the code M prime with the underlying value B bound to Y. You see, the razor and the handler are sharing a secret. And in this manner, bypass all other code that might have been linked in like from a library. You never have to worry that your exception error, whatever you call it, will be intercepted by some other module can't happen because it's part of an initialization to allocate dynamically new exception, even if you called them the same thing. Now this has consequences you're not gonna like. 
But I actually, well, I'm putting thoughts in your head. So excuse me for doing that. It's for rhetorical purposes. So my idea is this, I'm going to now attack, I'm sorry, uh, a number of common ideas that I detest. And what is the reason? Because if you understand exceptions properly, they make no sense. So let me explain them to you, okay? If you forgive me, this part where I'm apologizing in advance, I'm sorry. Okay, I think I've made this point. Oh, okay, let me look here. I thought I had was, I thought my next slide was something else. Let me just check what I have here. Okay, yeah, so I, I mentioned it. Okay, uh, I made a little joke here. It is imperative that the generation be dynamic. I saw those play on words. Okay, so the point is, it is an effect, it's an imperative concept. And moreover, you must do this. Okay, because that way it cannot be intercepted. And so you have, and it's, and as I just remarked a moment ago, it's absolutely indispensable for modularity. That's how you keep modules permanently and always separate from one another. You never can get uh, unintended interactions. Okay, so that's, uh, that's important. And then now one of the implications of this though, I must tell you, it's impossible to name an exception. The standard thing where someone, where a compiler says, like New Jersey does this, and it says uncaught exception error. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but it's bullshit. And the reason is you cannot name the exception that has been raised because of the miracle of alpha conversion. It has no name from the outside because any name you think it has is wrong. As I was saying to you uh, a few moments ago, and it's of the essence, you must do this. So what New Jersey does is it also tells you it was raised it was raised at a you know, sor uh, source file, you know, food at line 713. That's useful, okay? But the fact that it's called error, that doesn't mean anything at all. The reason is, if you look at it, I mean, uh, and I, I'll just jot down something which is illustrative, uh, is if I do something like this, using a, a ML notation, that exception X, just write it like that, in raise X, Well, what are you supposed to say here? This code executes, it has an uncaught exception, but the exception is declared in a block in which it is alpha, it, it, is, it is a bound identifier. So where do you get off saying uncaught exception X? Well, you don't, it doesn't make any sense. It's more or less the same, yeah, it's more or less the same as reporting a memory address. Like whatever, I don't know, it doesn't mean anything to me and, and it shouldn't, okay? so. This is, this is a, an important point to notice. It leads me to two things, okay, that I, that I want to mention. Therefore, the perennial idea that never works and always comes up every few years is having throws clauses and the types of functions or something like this, procedures, methods, whatever you want to call it. It never makes any sense. And there are two reasons for it that I want to get across to you. One is you cannot name the exception that it throws. And if you notice, if you ever programmed Java, when I taught a class involving Java, I, I showed the students uh, by empirical method, I gave them a piece of code that uses the so-called visitor pattern, which you and I know as higher order functions. If you use higher order functions in a clumsy way in Java, you will discover that you have to mark every method as raising every exception, otherwise it won't type check, okay? It's insane, it doesn't work. It, why does it not work? Because it cannot work. A priori, I know that it cannot work. So when I went to teach that section, I said, okay, this doesn't work. Let me just figure out how to show that it doesn't work because I know it doesn't work, can't work. Why do I say it like this? It's not an egotistical statement. I'm trying to say to you, if you know the science, if you know the theory, then you will know that some crazy idea, which everybody loves, actually doesn't work. And whatever they did, you know already, you don't even have to look. It already doesn't make sense. That's what I would like to convey to you because that's the importance of doing PL theory and it's why programming language design is not like, is it something that has to be left to the experts. That's the one of my meta messages here, uh, which I'll get back to in a minute. So the point is that throws clauses never, oh yeah, I use this, this example right here. Throws clauses never make any sense because you, it's, what, what do I say? If I look at that piece of code I've written here, which is uh, indicated here, if I look at this piece of code, well, what are you gonna say it throws? And if you don't say that it throws something, it actually does. Oh yeah. So now, now you ask yourself, then what is the meaning of a throws clause? Got me. 
okay? Because you're not able to name the things that it throws. Therefore, it's gonna throw things that you didn't say. And therefore, what is the point of saying that it throws something? There is no point. Now I can tell you the flip side though, and this is in the Sonoma paper I mentioned. It is possible and what you should be doing and could be doing is stating what something cannot throw. I have never seen a programming language that does this. Uh, if you know of one, I'd be really delighted to find out about it. I've seen many with throws clauses, this is like the standard mistake. But what does make sense is a doesn't throw clause because if you escape the scope, if you say that a piece of code doesn't throw X and you escape the scope of X, it's perfectly sound to drop this information. I'm no longer able to tell you it doesn't throw X because I'm no longer able to even mention X because I'm out of scope. But it's sound, it's just it. incomplete as it must be because it's a static approximation to the truth. So one of the lessons that comes directly out of understanding the theory of what's going on here is you can have doesn't throw clauses, but I've never once seen a language that has it. Weird. Everybody thinks you're supposed to have throws clauses. They never make sense. And nobody, as far as I'm aware, has ever thought of the fact that what you're really supposed to be saying doesn't throw. And why is that important? Well, think about it like if you program, many of you, maybe all of you have programmed in one of the ML family languages, Haskell ML, various version of ML. What, what you know is, is that if, if I go back to what I said in the beginning with, with finite sums or you know, re recursive types over finite sums is you have coverage checking with pattern meshing. You know that you have, you've covered everything. That's what the does not throw clause is doing for you. If I write a handler around a piece of code, I now know it does not throw that exception. And the point of the handler is to handle it. And the information you are gained is that exception cannot be thrown because I just handled it. Oh, you see, it's exactly the right idea. And it falls out of understanding the theory. And so that's the, uh, the two points I want to make about this is the nature of exceptions and attaching them to en encryption, I alluded to it a previous lecture and people were intrigued enough that I thought I should devote some time to this. And it has some implications and I'm spelling them out for you, spelling them out for you here. And so if you're designing your own language sometime in the future, I hope you'll remember, oh yeah, didn't that, that guy say something about this? You know, you can look it up, good, that, that would be great. Okay, whether you decide, you know, whatever you decide to do, okay, it's up to you. But anyway, I wanna lay down some particular points because they fall right out of understanding the underlying semantics. That's the critical, the critical idea. Okay, good. So that's uh, that's what I wanted to close with today, and I can I would be happy to entertain questions. And I realized that I didn't have time, unless I make a, a, a take an opportunity. But given the, the amount of time I've I've been given, I don't want to overstay my welcome. I I didn't have time to go into like. The theory program modules. It would take me a little while to explain it to you. It's it's a I will just say it's a beautiful subject, and I'll be delighted to explain it to you if I have the chance. Okay, so therefore, let me just close here, and then I'll be very happy to have a discussion with you. I think that'd be a nice way to close things off. So I guess I've made all these points all the way along, but if there's something I wanted to kind of convey, um, at least this is my uh, yeah, this is my my intention as a teacher. So I want to say that it's a non-negotiable point that PL design starts with PL theory. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been shown over and over again when people do language design without understanding a lick of PL theory, they do things that uh, have only been harmful. And there's a very richly developed theory of programming languages, a chunk of which is represented in my book, for example, but there are other books and other, other things that I didn't come anywhere near uh, explaining about. But there is a large and growing body of work in PL theory. And I, myself, I consider non-negotiable. Anybody who sort of, in fact, my conversation with Jane Street this morning was they came to me and they said, look, we want to design new programming language, but we know we need somebody who knows what they're doing. And I was like, let me hug you. Okay, so it's like they want to hire somebody who understands PL theory and can hack, knows how what it has to do with practice. That's a hugely valuable skill. 
And a beautiful thing about our field is that the theoretical considerations have direct bearing on the running code. That's what I've loved about it from day one. And you can draw these things out and that's like a really nice thing. So I was explaining that. So to me, that's a non-negotiable point. There is a discussion on Slack. I understand that you may disagree with me. You're fully entitled to disagree with me. I am stating like opinions or drawing conclusions from the course of my career and I can convey those to you. And of course you can disagree with them. So let me just be clear about that. Okay, so, but this is this is my, my, my worldview on here. The second thing is that PL implementation, which I haven't talked about at all, writing compiler derives from proper design. Compiler is not some ad hoc thing that you kludge up. In fact, it's all driven by type. And the history of my career students, my students and I and other, they're eventually their students and student students have developed these ideas quite a lot about how to use types during translation, type directed translation, leading to the idea of a certified compiler where you generate object code that has provably checkable well behavior properties. Beautiful idea, I think. And in order to do this, uh, you need to start out with a decent type structure from, from, from day one. So implementation depends on that. And then program verification, whether it's like what you do on the piece of paper while you're thinking your code out, or if it has something to do with mechanized proof, okay, it depends on having a well-defined programming language. Uh, a glib way to say it is, you can't say something about nothing. If you have something that isn't, isn't even properly defined, you write some code in it, you can't expect to prove a theorem about it. I'm sorry. Okay, that just isn't going to work. And, and so, like, from my perspective, that's a, it's of the essence that these, these ideas, this, like, all these ideas, this, this go together. It's, it's all of a piece. This is like how you get to a good spot. But it does require a lot of groundwork. And I know from discussion, and I, I am sympathetic to the points that were raised in discussion which is that, you know, unfortunately it does, it does mean you have to learn something. I, I don't know exactly what else to say. I mean, it, I don't have some response to that. If, you, if the criticism is, oh, we're using all these fancy schmancy ideas and so on. I, I, well, okay, I, what can I do? I plead guilty. Uh, but the experience in language design has been, this is what you need. If you don't do this, you're not going to get it right. And so if I want to, that would be my, my closing thought for these lectures. And uh, so what I would like to do then is I want to, would like to end there. And then if we would like to have a discussion, I'd be very happy to have a discussion with you. And perhaps it'll be an opportunity and I'll, I'm not sure if we'll manage that. Uh, and I can, I, I, will, I have plenty to say about program modules. So, uh, but it, it takes a, it takes a while to develop enough ideas so that I can actually say them. So, so that's, that's part of the problem, so to speak, is that um, uh, some of these ideas do require a lot of development. I'm sorry, I can't help that. And I'm a professor, so I try to teach them. That's, a, that's how I excuse myself. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's just the way it is. Okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. I'm very happy to hang out and have further discussion with you. Uh, I hope I haven't... Uh, uh, aggravated, annoyed too, ma too, too many of you with some of these points of view, but I am trying to explain at least why I have them. So, so I think that's uh, good. Okay, good. So thank you for, the, for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Bob. And uh, <clears throat> can you please stop sharing uh, your screen? Stop, stop sharing? Okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Please. Okay, I've done it. Okay then something else must happen, but it's not happening. Uh, Jim? Okay. Um, not there. Oh, no, it's here. So Jim, is it uh, uh, somebody doing the, the stuff? All oh, right, thank you, Harrison, for helping me out uh, today. Someone mentioned in the chat. Uh, uh, Harrison, can you speak so that you're, you're become the guy in the window? Oh, sure, thanks. Uh, hi, yeah, thank you for your help uh, monitoring things uh, this week. That was very, very, very helpful. Thanks. Ah. Uh, so I'd like to say something ah. <laughs> while we're not yet answering questions. Uh, Maybe we can, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. 
can you see my screen? Yes. Wait. Wait let me see. Sorry about that. Uh, hey. yes. um, so I'd like to say a few things in the name of everyone participating in this event. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Robert, for you know taking the time to uh, teach us about all those very interesting things, uh, and especially for um, you know making it interesting for both beginners and more experienced people um, by shining new perspectives on things. Uh, I really enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed all the critiques <laughs> and the way you care about, like you really care about this subject. Uh, I do. And for making, for making us question a lot of things. So I think uh, many other people attending your lectures also feel that way. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. I, I, I must say the summer school, the subject matter uh, in general, and the summer school in particular, very important to me. It's a central part of my life. I look forward to it every year. And uh, even though it's online, it's a little bit less than ideal, but on the other hand, it reaches more people. So I'm really delighted about that. So uh, I appreciate very much your, your words and thank you for listening to me and giving me the opportunity to speak. I look forward to it every year. Okay, you can continue the discussion if uh, uh, you have further questions. Yeah, we'll have to see if we can fit some lecture about modules into the schedule. I'm not sure whether that's possible. I don't want to over overstay my welcome as it were. Yeah, Plenty you can think people. about it and then you can just yeah. post mm -hmm. it on uh, on Slack, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just have to find a slot, that's your show. Mm -hmm. And my slides are all in Dropbox for future reference, so. <clears throat> So Bob, a few months ago, I had to give it, I was invited to give a talk to a GNC, which is Guidance, Navigation and Controls uh, community, which is, um, you know, way different than our world. Uh, and they're interested in auto code generation, stuff like this. And they, somebody in that community realized I had some experience at this and they asked me to give a talk. And about every other slide I had, I had this quote, this statement, if you're going to build a programming language, you need to, you know, engage the programming language community. And I don't know if this would, the, the comments I got were very interesting. One, I mean, a lot of these people just have no idea there is such a thing. You know, it's, right. it, it's hey, you know, Alice is really good at Simulink and MATLAB, so she's our computing expert. And it's not a physics problem, so it's not a hard problem. It's quite something we hear in my world a lot. But um, one person was commented, this was someone from the European Space Agency, is like, this probably left a lot of us uh, uncomfortable because there's, you're talking about a community that always preaches the need for expert, but they always mean hire one of us. <laughs> and I think that's a general uh, uh, theme for every community, but when you you know, at least I got some people thinking about that. Maybe you need to engage some other people. <laughs> so hopefully I could help spread the religion. Well, thank you for that. Uh, the summer school is one of my major vehicles for trying to uh, transfer these ideas and get people to at least think about them, maybe take them up and promote them to others. That's why I've been doing it for nearly 20 years. Yeah. At this point, you know, that amounts to, amounts to almost like 2,000 people. Go ahead. Go ahead, I interrupted someone accidentally. Uh, so, yeah, first, I just wanted to know, some, it was, there was some 
some discussion at the beginning of, uh, I mean, on the first or second day of this workshop that uh, maybe you could have a, you know, a, a separate online session even when, even after the COVID, uh, because it would be very useful because I'm not a programming languages person. I'm more interested in algorithms, but uh, I mean, these, these talks have been very, very interesting and illuminating for me also. Uh, so I just want to say that. Uh, so, I mean, the, the online session should, should be cut, should be continued next year as well as my uh, request. Uh, that's all. That's all. I think. Uh, I'm hearing. I'm hearing. Is it, is it just me? I hear some background that sounds like a dog or something. I don't know what. I can't oh, quite tell that's, what's that's going That's possible. On. Yeah, I'm. Si I'm sitting in a cafe. That's why. That's why. Sorry about that. Ah, that's what it yeah, is. Uh, okay. Yeah. That was a little difficult yeah, for me yeah. to understand you. I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But I just want to say thanks for the fantastic lectures uh, to all of you as well. It's, it's, it's been a great. Now you're interrupted. Well, I'm sorry. You can put something on chat, please. That uh, yeah, would be helpful. Yeah, there's the networking. I don't know about you, but everyone else, but from my point of view, you blacked out and there was a network delay. I'm, I'm back. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, can, you, can you see me now? Yeah, I, I just, yeah. Just want to say that. That's all. Just want to make a request and it be continued next year as well, the online portion of the program. Okay, so, thanks. I have a question. Um, so throughout these lectures, we sort of have been, um, you know, kept kept adding features to on, on top of our programming language, right? Uh, how do we make sure that when we're adding these features that they're not stepping on each other and and, and messing each that, other up? That's a, that's a very serious issue. It's a very good question. That's a very serious issue for which I don't have an easy answer for you. As far as I am aware of it, every single language that is a collection of features in the sense that I've been describing them is a problem unto itself. And the main tool we have for controlling, if you want to say interference or whatever the word you'd like to use is, uh, the main tool is mechanization. That what I do, for example, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you before, but Carl Curry and I have mechanized all of standard ML and proof type safety for the language using 12. And there's a, there's a tarball on my webpage, which you can look up there that uh, we did uh, in 2009, actually. Um, it was subsequent to the Poplamark challenge, which we uh, solved in two and a half weeks. Uh, and, uh, and then we went on and did a full scale verification. My point there is that it has to be treated as a thing in itself. Everything you do, unfortunately, you know, people speak, and I understand the intuitions, but people speak of orthogonality of language features in a loose way. I think that terminology originated with Algol 68, possibly. But in any case, uh, but as far as I know, there's no theory of that. Uh, Felizen has taken a crack at it, and I know this, uh, but uh, no one has ever been able to get very far with it. So what I, the only thing I can offer is, if you have a, a, a mechanization, so like in our case, we have a body of 12 code, we know what it means to bung in something. And the way 12 works is it does coverage checking for us and tells us exactly the spots where we have to update our proofs. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I could amplify that uh, if, if you'd like to explain how that actually works, but there, it's, uh, it's the right tool for the job. And the reason we succeeded in the Popmark Challenge is exactly because, uh, well, uh, it's the best tool for the job. You know, it took six months for half a solution in Cock to, to limp in, and it took two years for a solution in Cock to show up at all because it's very painful to do in Cock. And so with 12, it's just exactly the ticket. I can explain why if you wish, but uh, let me let me say that in answer to your question. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would be interested in why and interested in, um, you know, any other you know, proof assistance, or I mean, these things are bright languages of themselves, right? With their with their own theories. If, if any sort of advancements, no. No. If the reason sort of... is is that the reason is it's very difficult to uh, to uh, uh, have a type of abstract syntax of ABTs in the kind that I'm explaining, and that's the that's the source of the problem. And the reason we succeed in twelve is because we can do that exactly at yeah, 12.org, someone mentioned, and uh, we can do it easily in 12. Uh, the idea, the high level idea is the following. I don't know if you're familiar with this jargon, but that 
Twelfth has embedded within it a, uh, a theorem prover for pi two sentences. I don't know if that jargon means anything to you, but they're all of the form for all exists. So things that are of the form for all exist, decidable property. Implicitly, it's some function is going on there because the input is for all, the output is the exist, and then there's some function which is a correctness thing. If you look carefully at the statement of preservation and progress, which I threw at you without going into any specifics, but is discussed in detail in my book, there are both of the form pi two sentences. So we can have 12 verify them automatically in the following sense. It's perfect. Just think about writing, a, so it's a for all exist sentence is, uh, is a, the proof of that can be thought of as being given by a function that takes the x's input and the y's as output, as I said. So what do I do? Well, I program an ML. I'm writing a proof of a pi two sentence. That's progress or preservation. I write out all the clauses, pattern matching on the X's and emitting the Y's in each case. So if I'm doing induction on typing, I'm pattern matching on the typing derivation. If I'm doing induction on transition, I'm pattern matching on the transition derivation. And then the 12th implementation checks that I've covered all of the cases. And it checks that the recursion is well-founded. I cannot write a proof that loops. And those two, so that's the coverage and termination checking. And those two things together, bingo, I write out the safety proof in a form that you can read. It's not like, oh, intros, intros, auto tech, simplify, no. Okay, it's a proof, you can read this proof. You can look at that code, it's just as readable as clean code in any programming language. You can say that's bad, but if you take ML or Haskell code, you can read that. I can sit down with you and read you my code and you would be have no problem with this. It's similar to that, I, it, it's code, but it's readable code. And so the proof is that it's, it ends up being 30,000 lines of 12 code that Carl and I pair programmed by meeting once a week for a semester. And that's what we did. And the meta lesson in that is we were able to put it down at the end of the week, come back a week later and resume where we left off. Why? Because of the miracle of the coverage checking. Just run it through 12 and says, oh, you know, you haven't covered this case yet. Oh, right, that's where we left off, good. So then we just carry on. It's a gorgeous thing and it's studiously ignored. So I, I have a beef about the pop mark challenge and I, I will just uh, mention that. Uh, the, it was the unintended victor in the pop mark challenge and we've had trouble getting that acknowledged right to this day, but that's uh, some social phenomenon. So have a look at that, have a look at that repo. 12, for this purpose, uh, for doing meta theory of programming languages, 12 is the perfect tool. It's based on the LF logical framework, if you know about that. So the idea is you write down the program and you write down all of its, its uh, typing system and its dynamics, you write down an LF, and then you use the prover to reason about the uh, canonical forms of certain types. That's the pi two, pi two sentences. Uh, I know it's a little bit sketchy, but I, I would have to give a lecture about how logical frameworks work. So uh, in preparing for this semester, for this summer, I went through numerous iterations of what I ought to tell you about. Uh, but the problem is it would take me forever. So I had to isolate a few things. That's what I did this week. Uh, but uh, if you don't know about logical framework, you don't know about 12, it, it, it pays big time to learn about them. Very, very useful tool. So, yeah, uh, when, when you had uh, Carsten Sherman gave lectures on uh, LF. So if yes. you look at the uh, website of PSS website, then you look at archive, there you find all the lectures from previous years. Now I don't remember which occurrence maybe was, I don't know, 2005 or six. Now, some years ago, Dan, Dan Lakata and I also gave lectures. Ah, OK, well. yeah. And, so, and we, were, we were working as a team. He was there sitting at the council ah, doing 12, yeah. and I was, I was lecturing about it. And there, then it, it must the be same. 2010. I don't remember, to be honest. But yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. yes. Yeah, and but anyway, so, yeah. Yes, and in the, in the same instance of OPLSS, there were lectures on using Isabel nominal Isabel to do the same thing. And there were lectures about uh, from some other, it might've been a cock person, but I actually, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. the, there was at least a nominal Isabel and us in 12. And we, 
in a certain sense, try to stage a competition for the OPLSS students of showing how to do this with these provers. So uh, that you know, things change from year to year. Right? So some years I have lectured about LF. Yeah, but those videos are accessible. So that's uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah, all the archive. Yeah, they're all there. So I, I think that your Giannis maybe was running it possibly. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah, smart yes. smart docus. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot there's a lot of value in that. I, I don't feel that when we put out uh, Carl and I put out the, the repo for the 12th development uh, on types list in 2009. And I don't recall ever hearing any, from anyone who ever looked at it. Go figure. But if you look, for example, in the, uh, uh, what is that called? The, um, um, The extensive project on doing mechanized meditary for programming languages uh, run by Pierce and Appel and uh, a bunch of other people. I can't think of the name of it at the moment. Uh, uh, software Foundations, thank you. Deep that's, that's spec. Thing. Yeah. You're talking yeah, about software. Deep Spec? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Deep Spec is part of the project. And the book series, they have a Software Foundation. So they try to do these things in clock. And you'll notice in volume, volume one, they immediately give up. And here's why they give up on getting capture, uh, getting substitution right, because when you have binding operators, it is way too painful in clock to try to have capture avoiding substitution. So they they just give the wrong definition and go on from there. Thank you for that. I have been trying to learn with software foundations, and now I'm going to take a look at twelve. Yeah. So that's where the issue lies: is that binding and scope not not handleable very well in those kind of provers for all their virtues, which uh, I don't diminish in one degree, but for the particular purpose of doing programming language meta theory, 12 seems to be a better tool. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I lectured on 12. Yeah, that, was it 08? Okay, could be. <laughs> it time flies. Yeah. Uh, so, about orthogonality of uh, different programming features. Um, I, I guess uh, what I, uh, in mathematical logic uh, with set theory and all those axioms that they added there when they were looking at it, they, they were able to um, talk about how like, for example, axiom of choice being uh, independent to certain other axioms. Um, can that idea be applied to um, orthogonality of inference rules, I guess, if, if you consider axioms to be like particular mm -hmm. cases of inference rules where there's not yeah, I, I, I something I'll have to think about. I don't I don't know how to respond straight away. Yeah, I, I don't know if it even applies at all. Mm -hmm. Just a yeah. random thought that came to mind. No, it's a it's yeah, it, it, I, I, I understand your sense. And I I it does make sense, but I, I don't know a useful thing to say at this moment. 